Hello everyone. Welcome to another episode of the Armchair Cricket podcast, a podcast focusing on test cricket by armchair critics of the game. Continuing with our World Cup digest covering the latest matches and news, today we'll be talking about matches number 15, 16 and 17. Uh, West Indies against uh, South Africa, played at Southampton, Bangladesh against Sri Lanka, played at Bristol, and Australia against Pakistan, played at also Bristol. Um let me welcome my co-host Ajit to talk about this. Hello Ajit. Hi Giri. How are you doing? Well, I have had quite an eventful couple of days. I lost a tooth. Oh. So I'm still recovering from that. Okay. Um and luckily for us I think there hasn't been much cricket going on primarily because of uh, inclement weather I have to say. I would say the rain gods have been kind to you so that you know they realize you're in trouble so they have prevented a couple of matches from happening so that you don't have to worry about it. Yeah. So How that's kind nice of them. Of them right? Mm-hmm. well i mean we can talk about it in a jovial way but you know this is the most uh, let's say rain affected world cup in all world cups mm. right so mm. we know we've already lost three matches this world cup so mm. the west indies south africa match was lost at 29 for 2 with south africa 29 for 2 uh, it, it was shaping up to be a really really tasty contest with the west indian bowlers sort of already proving to be very mm-hmm. heavy mm-hmm. but it didn't go through and then bangladesh and sri lanka was completely abandoned without even a toss so this meant three matches were already lost maybe you know given the number of matches most teams will be able to make it up because pakistan is one of the matches that has been affected so are sri lanka but we'll have to see mm-hmm. right going forward it's very important to the chances of these teams like teams like sri lanka pakistan bangladesh you, who knows you know in one of the upcoming matches for example india new zealand it may be rained off they say right weather is inclement right through this week so many matches are expected to be affected and maybe there will be more than one complete no result that means you know um, many teams will have to be very careful with the remaining matches how they pace themselves maybe pay a bit more attention on the net run rate because it looks like some teams will lose a chance at getting two full points right mm. so for example this bangladesh and sri lanka match would have been a real real interesting one because both teams are sort of bouncing back bangladesh needing a reaffirmation and sri lanka also because you know they've only won one matches each and with respect to west indies and south africa well south africa were i think very desperate to play this full match and get no two points but we wouldn't know what would have happened so but it looked like the west indian team started off very very solidly yeah. did you catch that uh, short uh, period of play maybe? Uh, unfortunately not but i only um, saw the you know uh, score card later uh, when i saw that two the first two wickets were lost uh, to sheldon cottrell right, right. Mm-hmm. no i mean he was bowling really well and ocean thomas had just been introduced into the attack so things were only going to get spicier but uh, mm-hmm. well rain gods had different ideas let's say mm. right when you look at all the chatter going on on social media a lot of people are really questioning uh, the wisdom of uh, scheduling a world cup in a time of the year where it's going to definitely rain in england right mm. it's like mm. having a lot of cricket in india in october or you know parts of different mm. parts of the world like that so mm. but i guess they had to hold it at some point in time and maybe this was sort of unexpected these things are not in our control so i think it's the best to make of what's available right but yeah maybe it adds a bit of bit of peak on intrigue into what's going on in this world cup because some matches are suddenly lost and there is also this chance that some um, some matches may suddenly get affected net run rates may get affected right not just the results so it brings in a certain unpredictable element and it might make it even more interesting if you're a fan that's the way i would take it right mm mm-hmm. yeah but i hope it doesn't continue in the same uh, you know same way for the remainder of the tournament because if we lose just too many matches mm. then i think that some of the teams which may have had an outside chance uh, and are currently not well placed in the table uh, it will be very difficult for them to uh, stage a comeback at the latter Indeed. part of the tournament so let's hope it gets better uh, because we approach july and july is normally warmer and uh, you know hopefully less wetter mm. compared to uh, june june is always a bit uh, circumspect i have to say and we see that here also in holland right so we see a lot of rain in this month so yeah let's well see. in our last match where we really could have used rain there was no rain uh, we lost <laughs> it a bit badly but mm-hmm. yeah well these things happen uh, let's look at the next match that was scheduled this is the match between australia and pakistan the 17th match of the league stage right and this one was a full game so again there were the rumors that it will be rain affected you may lose about 50% of play time so on and so on but luckily none of those things happened and a full match was played out it was played on the cooper associates county ground in taunton it was a wonderful match 
right in this game pakistan won the toss and they opted to bowl they started off very brightly with aaron finch and david warner giving australia an explosive start by adding 146 in just 22 overs so aaron finch was the first to go dismissed for 82 of 84 balls uh, david warner started off a bit sedately as usual but uh, he picked up the pace really well as the innings went on and he finished with a well made 107 of 111 balls keeping him company were a bunch of uh, you know useful contributions down the middle order steven smith made 10 maxwell 20 sean marsh 23 usman khwaja 18 and alex carey 20 and the tail also kept him company until a little bit but in this case the credit goes to the pakistani bowling because up until when glen maxwell was dismissed this was 223 for 2 in just the 34th over australia looked properly placed for a 350 plus score even a 380 maybe right from then there started a slide where first shahin shah afridi got rid of glen maxwell and then amir took over where he broke the middle order up by dismissing sean marsh usman khwaja and alex carey right and then came back to finish his 54 by dismissing mitchell stark so this is mohammad amir's first 54 in odis and he took 54 in an excellent excellent bowling spell where mm-hmm. the rest of his teammates were very very costly so for example shahin shah afridi took 2 for 70 Hasan Ali took one for 67. Bahab Riaz was okay in the end. Him and Amir did all the damage one can say because Bahab Riaz took one for 44 in eight overs. Hafiz was a bit costly. He went for 60 runs in seven overs and took a solitary wicket. And Shoaib Malik completed the rest of the overs. So when it came their turn to bat, Fakhar Zaman was dismissed by Pat Cummins in the very first over. Right. So he was trying to hit the ball out and was caught at third man off an edge. Imam Ul Haq was his steady self and Babar Azam and him took the score forward. So they took the score to 56 when Babar Azam was dismissed for 30, right? Uh, going for a slightly expansive shot, but he was going really well, and I think that was his role to aggress in this game so that uh, they never fall behind run rate. But uh, once he was dismissed, Muhammad Hafiz came in and sort of followed the same template. He made 46 of 49. There was a problem when both Imam and uh, Muhammad Hafiz were dismissed very close to each other. So Imam was out for 53 of 75 balls, and then in the very next over, Muhammad Hafiz followed him. on with the score on 146 this was really really a problematic thing for pakistan but sarfraz ahmed who was batting at 5 made a very patient 40 and he kept the rest of the middle order and lower order company so shoaib malik could not add any score and asif ali got out cheaply uh, by the australian pacers but hasan ali and wahab riaz then made telling contributions to pakistan's lineup by hasan ali added 32 of just 15 balls and then wahab riaz added 45 of 39 balls and all this while sharfa zamat kept rotating the strike and was happy to you know see this happen you know going into the 45th 44th 45th over there was still a reasonable chance because uh, when wahab riaz was still batting it was the 45th over and pakistan had reached 264 for 7 so this meant if him and sharfa could take another 30 runs in the next four overs or five overs even give them such 20 of the last two this was going to be a classic classic match unfortunately um, wahab riaz was dismissed by stark who then went on to dismiss amir in the same over so again stark proved to be very effective towards the death and then sarfas did his bit with the last man but he was run out and pakistan were all out for 266 in spite of their best efforts so this was a much closer match than can be visible on the scorecard when it comes to the bowling pat cummins took 3 for 33 mitchell stark 2 for 43 ken richardson who came in to the squad took 2 for 62 he was a bit costly and nathan coulter nile took 1 for 53 glen maxwell and aaron finch went for a few runs but aaron finch took a surprise wicket he was the guy that dismissed hafiz of really hitable full toss but unfortunately hafiz hit it straight to david wicket so this meant you know australia win and they continue their winning run but i think pakistan will need a bit of introspection what do you think giri oh well uh, to start with a couple of points uh, especially about the weather i think when they started in the morning uh, it was really cold i think the temperature must have been in the single digits uh, at taunton and uh, it was cloudy uh, throughout so there was an expectation of uh, rain but i think it did not arrive mm. um and pakistan chose to bowl first i think which would have been the wise thing to do looking at the weather um and aaron finch said also that he would have done the same right um but the other thing i think the the difference in the match which uh, settled uh, the score in australia's favor i have to say it was the first 10 overs that the pakistanis uh, bowled right apart from mohammad amir no one else tried to keep it tight you know they were trying to experiment a bit of uh, a lot of things especially shahin shah afridi afridi who shared the new ball with uh, mohammad amir i happened to catch this uh, passage of play where he was trying to bowl good length or short of good length because of his height especially he was not trying to pitch the ball up and bowl in that uh, corridor of uh, uncertainty so aaron finch was able to you know uh, pull him uh, to the boundary and all those things 
Um, so Pakistan missed uh, a few things there up the order. So I'm, I'm actually a bit surprised that he started with uh, Shahin Shah Fridi and uh, Amir. Amir would have been the natural choice, of course. Perhaps mm-hmm. Sarfras could have, um, you know, gone with uh, Hassan Ali uh, for a bit of variety because these two are, you know, left-arm fast bowlers. And you also have Wahab Riyaz, another left-arm fast bowler. So to uh, make it a bit more, uh, you know, um, Difficult for the Australian batsmen to get used to. Uh, I would have uh, thought, you know, uh, Sarfras could have used uh, Hassan Ali. And I think the other thing is uh, fielding was a bit dif- difficult uh, as the weather was a bit cold. I think if you catch a ball, I think you've caught a ball when it's uh, cold outside and then it really hurts you, right? It, it, it hurts your palm. Um, mm-hmm. And... Mm-hmm. It was the same with Pakistanis and uh, Asif Ali, who was fielding, I believe, in the slips, dropped right. uh, a reasonably comfortable catch of Aaron Finch. And mm-hmm. I think Aaron mm-hmm. Finch uh, was still probably in his 20s. Yeah. Um, yeah. He was just starting up. Uh, and this was before the 10th over. And it was when uh, Sarfras had introduced a bowling change. And Wahab Riaz, uh, Wahab Riaz was the bowler then. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, so you have to feel for the bowler because it was probably a comfortable chance which uh, chance which Asif Ali spilled. I, I also noticed that normally Babar uh, fields in the slips and on this occasion Asif Ali who is I think probably a good outfielder uh, was fielding in the slips. I don't understand why he was there. Mm-hmm. Uh, Babar probably would have caught this but then again you know uh, this, this is all a bit of if and uh, what not. Um, mm-hmm. So I think if Aaron Finch was out at that point in time, um, Australia would not have been able to accelerate as much as they did. And they were about 140 odd, right, when they lost their first wicket. So that probably could have made a difference. Um, And I think another experiment with uh, Glenn Maxwell that failed uh, with Australia, right? Mm -hmm. So he was uh, sent up the order um, reasonably, I think. And Stoin is missed out in this match because of a side strain, I understood. And that's why uh, Kane uh, Richardson is it Richardson? Yeah, Kane Richardson uh, was drafted in. Right. Um, I think Pakistan might have considered 20 or 30 runs more than they should have uh, when they won the toss, of course. But looking at how their opening partnership went, uh, Australia's opening partnership went, batting partnership, and uh, how they were placed at one point in time, I think they were 170 odd in about 20 or 28 overs or so. Uh, for a loss of one wicket or two wickets. And looking at that, you would have probably doubled the score. So Australia should have scored nearly 340, 350. But right. Pakistan re- did really well uh, to rein them in and uh, you know restrict them to just over 300. Mm-hmm. Um, all due credit to Mohamed Amir. I think he was the uh, outstanding uh, uh, player for Pakistan in this match. Uh, but all in all, uh, disappointing again from uh, Pakistan's perspective. I think they could have done better. Um, the next match they play is, of course, against India at Old Trafford. Weather mm-hmm. permitting, uh, we should be on for a cracker. Pakistan always, you know, Pakistan India is always a fantastic spectacle. Of course. Well, I mean, look, <clears throat> I think Asif Ali was also the culprit when he dropped David Warner. With Warner, I think, very close to just 15 runs. Right, mm. he dropped him at third man. Another, yeah. it, it it was very much a sitter. Unfortunately, that should have been taken, and that would have again changed the direction of the game as far as Pakistan were concerned. I think, mm. right? So these few costly errors probably cost them, as you say, maybe 20, 30 runs and made a really big difference at the end result. But what I take away from this game, for as far as Pakistan is concerned, is that fighting spirit. You know, you fight a lot and you lose. It's okay. You have something positive to look forward to. It was not a thrashing. Right. Mm. In spite of a completely brittle middle order there, the lower order contributed, the skipper had his uh, you know, head and somehow mm. they were able to get really close. They were able to come to a point where it was still more than um, probably 6.8 or 7 runs and over even at that mm. stage. And that's achievable. Right. If, if they were full batsmen, there, there was not going to be any doubt that they were going to finish the match off. Right. So that's one thing. The other thing, well, uh, when I was listening to a couple of other analysis shows, for example, Caught Behind or Game On Hai from uh, YouTube, I heard that, you know, they, the experts, Rashid Latif, Shoaib Akhtar and a few others, they identified a couple of technical flaws in Shaheen Shah Afridi's bowling with mm. his wrist and how he cocks it or how he doesn't at the time of release of the delivery and so on, purely technical things. Mm. They felt that these things should be identified and fixed in a net situation and it's costing him some pace and also the direction. Uh, also, I think Shohab Akhtar once said even the length might be impacted by it. So basically, his entire delivery is getting impacted by some technical uh, problems he's facing. So that might have to be addressed, they felt. And 
I think they were rightly a bit miffed that they probably uh, these things should probably be fixed by a bowling coach, right? Mm. So some small things there, some small points. But mm. overall, I think if you look at uh, the scorecard just now, you know, uh, it it looks like um, you know Pakistan is now eighth, unfortunately, uh, having played four matches, having one no result and two losses. They have only three points, and uh, that that will not be a good thing. And Australia are uh, near the top because they have played four matches, but they have won three, and along with New Zealand, they're right at the top, right? Mm. So this is something Pakistan will want to remedy very quickly in the next two or three games, right? Yeah, and also Shoaib Malik, uh, another failure, right? He's, yeah. I think he's probably batting too far down the order. Is well, he coming I mean, in too late? Do you think? I think no. For me, it looked like they worked him out. The Pacers. Uh, mm-hmm. Sort of worked him over and then worked him out. So he made a duck of just two balls. And Pat Cummins, I, he inside edged it, and it was a great catch by the keeper Carey. Mm-hmm. But it looked like yeah, he was sort of backing away from the ball. Mm-hmm. It was a bit uncustomary to see somebody so experienced to do it. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, it, maybe he was not in the right mindset. But five and six, I think it's still fine. So for mm-hmm. me, I would bat for Malik at six because he has the finishing capabilities and he has done it a couple of times as recently as those matches in South Africa series right mm. I think he did some finishing and uh, also uh, in the previous series before that in UAE so I would say it's okay that he can bat at six uh, as long as he feels comfortable playing the pace and you can expect that most bowlers uh, fast bowlers mm-hmm. are 140 mm-hmm. plus and they're sort of hunting in packs this World Cup so as mm-hmm. long as his confidence is up there I think that's the only thing if he feels mm-hmm. confident, he's still a part of this 11 for me. But otherwise, they may want to look at whether Imad was, can take his place. But Imad Basim is still equally suspect. Like in short mm-hmm. bowling, they, they tell mm-hmm. us, right? So mm-hmm. it's it's not an easy choice for them. There are mm-hmm. other options. But for me, Sarfra's batting at five seems to be the most logical one. I mm-hmm. wouldn't want to disturb that because he mm-hmm. can nicely act as a fulcrum because they have these solid sort of players who bat at the top and some hitters at the bottom. He can sort of be the guy that keeps the engine room, engine room running at this case mm-hmm. say you no know, mm-hmm. keep stoking the coal in so mm-hmm. the machine never stops and then the rest of the hitters can take over so it, it sort of worked out almost because Wahab Riyas and Hassan Ali did their bit there right and Asif mm-hmm. Ali could have been a real game changer here if Asif Ali had got in a 30 or something I think Pakistan would have won this game mm-hmm. unfortunately he couldn't do that so overall there are some negatives that Pakistan will need to iron out outside of this uh, game but you know in the next two to three games they're very it's very important for them and also big games coming up as far as they're concerned there is mm. the next games against india and so on so uh, 16th is the game against india mm. i think a uh, lot of hype already with some uh, wonderful ads on both sides of the border or <laughs> depending yeah. on how you look at it of course yeah. Yeah. so um at the end of the day it looks like you know um it might be that pakistan will need to win the next two or three convincingly so that they don't have the pressure going into the last two games Right, so yeah. Australia will have a lot of positives to count from. They had lost to India, but they can take heart from the way they beat Pakistan here, and it was a close enough encounter that they know uh, they were good. They'll still want to address the middle order, uh, you know, shakiness that they have seen. Maybe where Khwaja should bat, whether both Khwaja and Sean Marsh belong in the eleven, and so on and so on. Anyway, those are some good discussion points as far as the match is concerned. Now, mm-hmm. going ahead, if you look at the other news from the World Cup. Right. So there is a fresh controversy when Shahzad has uh, put up a video on YouTube. We were discussing. He's come out and said outright that he will retire if they don't want him to play. He says he's carrying an injury, but he's still fit enough to play. But Asadullah Khan, the chief executive of Afghan Cricket Board, says, you know, he's carrying an injury and we don't want to risk him. So, you know, and we don't want to play a player with an injury. We we have a chance of replacement. So we've gone for a very fit player who can replace him. So it's something boiling on the side. We will probably wait and watch to see what goes. Right. This is a very, mm-hmm. it's a very um, passionate player who plays with uh, his, you know, heart on the sleeve, as they say. But that makes him a bit vulnerable for the, you know, doing these sort of outbursts. Right, Giri? Mm-hmm. Mm, yeah. Well, he's an international uh, cricketer. So I think he needs to... Um... Show some calmness there. Uh, he shouldn't be over the top. Uh, he can discuss all these things probably internally and then later issue a press release or something. He, I think this is he's probably um, being blown out of proportions in some way. Mm. Uh, because if this is something privy uh, to the team, it should not be, you know, you don't wash your dirty line in public. Right. Mm-hmm. So don't do, do that. I mean, he has to protect the interests of his national team. I know he's very passionate about uh, cricket and he loves to play for Afghanistan, but he should also consider his teammates, what it's going to do to them when he comes out and then speaks uh, and makes a statement like this out in the public. Right. Indeed. Indeed. Unbridled. 
Well, I mean, you know, there is the other component these days that social media is actually used as a crowbar, so to say. Mm. When you have enough people, when you express something so openly in public and you have enough people backing you, mm. the bodies that were to make these decisions would actually feel the pressure and they would be sort of pressurized to act in your favor. So this might be the, you know, the overall yeah. goal or whatever, but mm. maybe, yeah, you're right that they should not have been the way to choose for uh, no, Shahzad. All right. Going forward, another, um, let's say, an interesting piece of news that, you know, Shikhar Dhawan, who suffered a thumb injury in the game against Australia, looks like he's out for at least three games because it's a hairline fracture. But there are chances that he may be ruled out for much longer, in fact, as much as the rest of the tournament. So India have flown in Rishabh Pant. Kiri, how much of an impact do you think this will make for India? A lot, a lot, because uh, in uh, ICC tournaments, 50-hour tournaments, mm. since the Champions Trophy uh, in 2017, if you look at Shikhar Dhawan's record, I think he, it has been immaculate. He has had a bunch of you know high scores, as well as leading India uh, from from the top of the order. I think he, he has been doing that consistently, along with Rohit Sharma, with whom he shares, I think, one of the most successful opening partnerships in uh, recent history in ODI cricket. Indeed. And this will rattle uh, India's uh, batting lineup because the top three, Shikhar Dhawan, Rohit Sharma and Virat Kohli, I think they were batting together as a unit. So they were always making sizable contributions. Um, if one of them failed, the other one would take over. Uh, now, if they don't have Shikhar Dhawan, they will have to promote somebody like KL Rahul, who is also a naturally opening batsman. But then, you know, it's a different role for him in the current team because I think he was primarily, uh, uh, you know, drafted into the squad as a number four player. Uh, now he has to make the move up, which means it opens up uh, another spot in number four. Uh, who will uh, it be? So, yeah, it's it's either Vijay Shankar or Dinesh Karthik. So I don't know who it's going to be. What do you think? So for me, I think it's Vijay Shankar who drafts into the 11 at number four. He was the original mm-hmm. choice, of course. Mm-hmm. But that meant that because uh, he was injured, Rahul took his place. But now Rahul is back at number one. Mm-hmm. Right. So I think Vijay Shankar slots back in. But you never know. With this horses for courses policy, India may go for Dinesh Karthik. Or who knows? They may even actually promote Dhoni if the total is you know, mm-hmm. already safe enough. Or you're already with 33rd, 35th over. Dhoni can play the holding role anyway. So mm-hmm. we are have to see, they may include uh, somebody like Ravindra Jadeja in the squad, mm-hmm. S- seat somebody like Bhuneshwar Kumar, maybe bring in Shami, right? Mm-hmm. And maybe Kuldeep Yadav may miss out. Then you may have both DK and, uh, you know, uh, Vijay Shankar. This is something I was th- thinking about because I think during the World Cup, uh, Jadeja will get about three games at least. This is mm-hmm. my thinking. And mm-hmm. later into the tournament, the more effective he can be because the pitches will also be a bit uh, used, right? Mm-hmm. That's where he comes into his best because he's a good test match bowler in India. So that's how he might be used is my feeling. And let's see, there are some options open for India here. So, you know, now that we are discussing so much about this, let's quickly take a look at uh, tomorrow's match, Giri, uh, the match between New Zealand and India. So this is mm-hmm. supposed to be played again at Nottingham, but mm-hmm. on a fresh pitch. So it's going to be played on one of the newer pitches near the center of the, uh, so to say, the playing area so that the both the boundaries are sort of at even distance. But because mm-hmm. it's a new pitch and we don't know how it is going to be. But then again, there is a lot of rain forecast. So do you think there'll even be a match tomorrow? Um, I'm not sure. I mean, let's hope there is a match tomorrow because we've had, I think, three matches lost to weather this time already. So let's hope there is a match tomorrow. Uh, and if there is, it's going to be very tricky. New Zealand uh, is one of the better teams in this World Cup. And they've already beaten India once in the warm-up match right? Uh, with Trent Bolt uh, causing uh, havoc through the top order. Mm-hmm. I think Rohit Sharma is going to be, uh, <laughs> is, has got to be very careful when he plays that uh, ball that comes in. Right. He he has that very sharp indipper. It comes in mm-hmm. at a very sharp angle. And also Rahul, I think Rahul was also dismissed in that match by Trent Bolt. It was bold. He dragged on, something like that. Um, so India have got to be wary of the threats of Trent Bolt uh, to start with. And then of Matt Henry and then Lockie Ferguson, uh, who have a very potent uh, you know, fast bowling lineup there. Um, so they will probably pepper India with a lot of uh, short of good length and uh, short pitch deliveries, especially Lockie Ferguson. I think he has genuine pace. Uh, it's going to be a, it's going to be very interesting if at all we're going to have a match. Of course, from well, India's perspective, uh, yeah, batting. You know, we they have to sort out the uh, b- opening partnership and the middle order because of mm-hmm. uh, Shikhar Dhawan's you know, unavailability. Right. Uh, and uh, bowling wise, I don't know if they'll bring in Shami this match. Uh, they had two spinners in the previous match. 
Mm. Uh, will they still have two spinners considering the weather? It's it's a bit uh, gloomy and uh, overcast and probably going to rain tomorrow, right? So will they need two spinners or will they have uh, three seamers and a spinner and then uh, an all-rounder? If it's a really truncated game, there is a high likelihood that India may actually go for an all-pace attack even. If it's a truncated mm. game, it's a very green pitch. India may go for an all-pace attack and maybe Jadeja comes in and only Yuzvendra Chahal plays and if that, and Shami may take Kuldeep Yadav's place. So, mm. as far as New Zealand are concerned, there is one more chance mm. that, you know, in, in the place of Colin de Grantham, they may play Tim Saudi. So that, you know, Saudi and Trent Bolt can actually exploit the swinging condition and they can really mm. stick it up India's nose, so to say. Mm. Right? Mm. This is the other interesting change that I already foresee. But it all depends on how, how long the match will be, what are the conditions at which point in time mm-hmm. the match will start and so on. Mm-hmm. Let's really hope for the best that there is really a game and we'll see how it goes from there. Right? Yeah. All right. If you were to look at some of the other events from outside the field, a couple of quick uh, stories. One is that, well, Yuvraj Singh has retired from all cricket, right? So he's been a true servant of Indian cricket and he's done wonderful things for India in limited overs cricket. He's been a dual World Cup winner with the World Cup win of T20 in 2007 and the uh, 50, 50 hour World Cup in 2011. So we salute him and we say thank you to him for all his efforts. Giri? Yeah, Yuvraj Singh has has been one of my favorite players uh, with his high back lift and very stylish, you know, a left-hander. I still remember uh, the explosive debut he had in that Champions Trophy match against Australia, right, as an 18-year-old. Right. right. Uh, so that's still etched in my memory and I have fond memories of him lifting India's World Cup uh, in uh, 2011, being uh-huh. the player of the tournament then, as well as in 2007 when he hit uh, Stuart Broad for those six sixes in an over. At uh, Kingsmead, right. So we we have a lot of good memories. Uh, I think uh, when it comes to Test cricket, he's somebody I wished who had done a lot more. I think he didn't live up to his potential when it came to the longer format of the match uh, of the game. Um, But otherwise, Yuvraj should feel proud of himself. He has he has had some fightbacks on personal front as well, right? So. um, So he recovered uh, from cancer after the 2011 World Cup, made a comeback. Uh, and I think he went back to the domestic circuit and the IPL uh, later on for the to finish off his career, so to speak. And now I think Look, he he, yeah. might, he might feel well proud, uh, and you know when he hangs up his boots and uh, yeah, he should look back and uh, feel proud about himself. Look, that in itself is a great deal to come back from cancer and really represent his country again. He can be really proud of his achievements. There's mm. always more he could have done, mm. but that's already a big enough achievement, I would say, and he can take pride in that. Right. Yeah. All right. The other piece of news is that, well, Christy Villion, who represents Namibia, has been given a four match suspension for uh, racist remarks. So this doesn't set a right precedent because Namibia play ODIs these days. Therefore, it might be televised or, you know, a lot more audiences might be attracted and it doesn't really look good for them if something like this is found. Right. I think uh, this is one of those ugly things that need to be fixed as far as cricket is concerned. Right, Giri. Now, let's go to the trivia questions. Uh, The trivia question from the previous episode was, well, India and Australia have met each other 12 times in the World Cups, and what is the number of wins for each team? The number of wins for India is four, and for Australia, it's eight. So, as usual, Yogesh, our good friend and supporter, has given the right answer, and we thank him. And he's also given a detailed analysis of each match, who won the match by how many runs, and so on. That's fantastic. We will not go into it here, but Thanks a lot, Yogesh, for your enthusiasm, and I hope you continue to, you know, uh, be involved in the same way. All right. The trivia question for this week is: We were speaking about Ash Barty in the previous episode, who won the French Open, right? She was a professional cricketer previously. We said. So, can you tell us which WBBL team she represented? You can get in touch with us for the right answer or your suggestions and comments through social media, for example, on Twitter at armchaircricketpod via our Facebook page or write into us at armchair.cricket at gmail.com. Don't forget to subscribe to our podcast and maybe, you know, talk about our podcast with your cricket friends so that we get more fresh ideas and more inspiration, right? There may be some abandonments in the matches here and there, but I expect that with a very packed schedule, uh, we'll have plenty of very exciting matches coming up. So I hope you guys do stay tuned in and I hope you keep listening to us. Having said all that, it's a goodbye from me. And it's a goodbye from him. Bye-bye. You're listening to the Armchair Cricket Podcast.